Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. My name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. It says here there's a light. Okay, I'll take this. My name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here. It's a privilege to be here, as it is at every Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And it's certainly a privilege to be asked to speak at a Pacific Group meeting. I want to thank Marilyn for asking me. I want to thank Clancy for the Pacific Group. I don't know if I got the billing right, but, uh... <laughs> what is it like? What happened and what is it like now? Well, I drank for 15 years, which is not long compared to some drinking stories I've heard. But it was long enough for me and I suffered enough pain at the end to stop or to get help. Uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm from across the water. I'm Welsh, which is a very good reason to be an alcoholic. <laughs> the Celtic disease. And that's what I heard when I first came into Wild Palestine. And what happened was that I, ever since uh, I was a little child from the age of four, I just fill you in about my background. When I was four years of age, born in South Wales. I, uh, my first memories of school convinced me that I was from an, on the wrong planet. I certainly didn't know what anyone was talking about. I had no friends. No school kid friends. I was the source of worry to my parents, especially my father. I was the only child. My father used to say to my mother, there's something very wrong with this boy, which is not the best foundation for mental health or confidence. <laughs> he didn't mean any harm by that, but that's what he said. And I can remember him. I can remember lying in bed when I was a kid and listening to my father next door whispering to my mother or talking about me. So I didn't have much confidence in myself. And I used to sit at the back of the class in school with my mouth open. I didn't know what they were talking about. And that stayed with me right up through all the years, through my adolescence, which is a painful time, as it is for everyone, my adolescence, through my early adulthood, if I ever reached early adulthood, right up until that first night in the Pacific Palisades meeting on December 29th, 1975. And I sat in that big room, and a man called Chuck C. got up there to speak. And I realized that I was not alone and that I'd somehow come home. I didn't uh, take that in intellectually. I understood intuitively, down in my gut, that I'd, I'd arrived home, that something had happened to me, that something significant had happened to me to change my life. Now, it sounds very simple, but that is exactly what happened. Um, and it changed my life. When I left school, I... Uh, but I had no future at all. By a series of accidents, I sort of stumbled into the acting profession. I became an actor, and I thought that would fix me. And I thought that if I could work hard and uh, really achieve success, then I would be fixed. The feelings inside me would go away. And, of course, there were moments when they did seem to have receded. Then, about the early 1960s, I started drinking in a real alcoholic way. I was doing my military service or draft. I... I didn't get into any trouble with booze. When I started thinking in the early 1960s, it was the beginning of a rapid descent into what I describe, can describe as hell. And uh, I worked in my profession. I, was, uh, I became a successful actor early on. I always worked. I was very little unemployed. But I worked harder than I was necessary, really. I used to be ahead of everyone three hours. I used to get to rehearsals three hours ahead of everyone else, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, so that I could beat everyone at the game so that I knew I knew all my business, I knew everything that was meant to be known, so that nobody could cross me, and especially directors, anyone in authority could 
He look at me in an odd way. I get them. <laughs> and I knew my stuff. I knew what I was talking about. Well, so I thought. I knew a lot. But it was killing me. And I started getting quite successful in my job. And the feelings got worse and worse and worse. I don't want to dwell on that side of my life. Because that's something that uh, was all part of it. But in that, a lot of extraordinary things started to happen. In 1974, um, one of my big dreams was to come to America. And uh, I came to New York to do a play. And I discovered the magic of the American bar. And they don't close. <laughs> like they do in England. And I'd also discovered tequila. I'd been in America about a year before, here in California, and I discovered tequila. And I loved tequila, and it did things to my brain which uh, really were a warm-up for this program. <laughs> and I went back to England in 1974, early 74, and uh, I used to watch television, and I couldn't, I knew I was coming back to America to do this play. And I used to watch television, and I used to watch I mean, programs like Starsky and Hudson. I thought, I remember saying to my wife, once looking at one of these films, I said, I bet they all drink tequila. <laughs> And she, not being an alcoholic, gave me one of those strange looks that they give you. Uh-huh. <laughs> She's one of those very peculiar ones. You know, she drinks a glass of wine regularly at six o'clock every night, pours the rest of it down the drain. Sometimes she pours it back into the bottle if she's poured too much. <laughs> she smokes two cigarettes a day and doesn't inhale. I don't know what her problem is, but... <laughs> Very, very strange. She's not an alcoholic. And I appreciate that because that's the way she is. And I have friends who are not alcoholics and they still are a puzzle to me. Old friends. I've got a friend of 30 years uh, standing and uh, <coughs> we go out to dinner sometimes and they, my wife and his wife and he, uh, they have a, a half bottle of wine between them. And when the waiter comes and they taste it, my wife usually does the tasting, she's the expert, and she swirls it around in her mouth. I thought, what the hell is she tasting? <laughs> and then she looks at the waiter, she's a bit nutty, yes, I think that's going to be okay. They leave, but that's how they leave it. Very odd. <laughs> but anyway, 1974, 74, I came back to, I came back to America, I came to New York, and I couldn't wait to get to those bars, and I started my job, I started rehearsing, and I turned up my first, uh, Rehearsal. There was a party the night before the first rehearsal day, and I turned up smashed, drunk, out of my mind, and insane. And uh, I told the playwright what was wrong with this play immediately. I told everyone else what was wrong with them. There was one woman in that party who was an alcoholic, and there's an alcoholic, and there's a member of AA. And she looked at me with one of those AA smiles. <laughs> her name is Mary, and I think it is because of her, for the grace of God, and Mary. Who really saved my skin because she didn't uh, do the, she didn't lecture me, she just smiled at me a lot. And uh, she knew I was a full blown alcoholic as soon as she met me. We started rehearsals and the play opened, it was a very successful play and she, you know, she used to keep an eye on me but she never told me anything about uh, alcoholism. Other people pointed her out to me and they said, you know Mary's an alcoholic, she's a member of AA. Scar, poor woman. <laughs> I said, is that why she smokes so much? Because she'd have to smoke and stop herself going crazy. And uh, she, they said that she doesn't drink anymore. What they were doing, they were feeding me with this information. And one night I took her out for uh, a drink over in the pub or the bar or whatever. And uh, I, didn't make, I didn't try to force a drink on her, but uh, I knew that uh, she was an alcoholic. And uh, I, I asked her a few questions. And then things got worse for me towards the end of my run in New York in 1975. I was very, very ill one night and uh, I'd been smoking a bit of grass. I wasn't my booze or my thing, but I was very drunk one night and I'd been smoking Acapulco Gold, whatever that is. <laughs> and uh, the CIA and the FBI were after me and uh... <laughs> So I asked Mary, I said, listen, can you take me out tomorrow? Can we talk because I'm in, I'm in bad shape? She said, yeah. So we went out for lunch the next day and she told me all about alcoholism. She told me all about this program. But in a very, very simple, insulting way, she said, you know, if you don't take the first drink, you can't get drunk which was very insulting to my intelligence. And, uh, she said it's like take, getting on the subway from Park Avenue and going all the way down to the Bowery. So you can get off any stuff you like. I thought, what the hell is she talking about? She's like an elevator going from the top floor to the, to the basement. You can get off at any floor you like. I thought, what? what's she painting these pretty pictures for me? I said, I know that. She said, would you like to come to a meeting? I said, no. <laughs> she 
said, okay. And she smiled at me. She said, well, maybe you're not an alcoholic. I said, I don't think I am. I've just got a problem with thinking. <laughs> so I stayed dry for six weeks, and it was okay, and I felt quite comfortable. It's one of those deceptive things. As the devil had got into me. I stayed dry for six weeks, and I really felt okay. I didn't want to drink. I used to go to the bar drink gallons of tonic water and diet patch and all that stuff. But I felt all right. I had one scare. I'd been in the hospital in New York with a clot in my leg um, because my lifestyle was getting to me. And the doctor said, you're going to die one day. You're going to die pretty, sharp, pretty soon. He said, how old are you? I said, I was 37. Then he said, well, you're going to die as soon as you... I don't think you'll make it until 40. And I got out of the hospital. And that didn't scare me. I went back to the booze. And I went back to drinking. I went back to everything else. But anyway, I got those uh, six weeks dry under my belt, and uh, the end of my last uh, night in New York, I went to a party, and I thought, well, I've got no problem with this now, because obviously I'm not an alcoholic, I've been able to handle it, and I poured into my Diet Coke or whatever it was, uh, vodka, tequila, whatever it was, I can't remember. And that was the beginning of, um, I don't remember much about that night, I remember nothing, in fact. Next day, I got on the plane and came out here to California. June 30th, 1975. And I stayed dry for a few more days. I was so shocked and uh, disgusted with myself because I thought, well, you know, there's something wrong with me. But I stayed dry. And I started work on a television thing. I was up at the beach here, Malibu, and uh, I saw this actress who said, would you like a drink at the end of my first day's work? And I said, no, I better go home because I think I've got a problem with it. She said, well, she said, you know, we'll want it. just one. It's only 5.30. I said, what is it? She said, tequila. <laughs> and she added one of those coffee cups, polystyrene cups, you know, and I could hear the ice rattling around and then I said, well, just one. And six months later, I woke up in AA. <laughs> and that was the worst thinking of six months of real hell. I started hallucinating. I spent time up on Tranker's Beach. I didn't know where I was. Most of the time, I started talking to the sea and it started talking back to me. And I, I really did hear voices and I started having quasi-religious experiences, which is very strange because I was an agnostic. And I saw, uh, I saw visions I really did see visions. I, I went out of this trailer home one night up in Tankers. I think it was up in Tankers. No, Paradise Cove it was. And, uh, Paradise Cove. And I walked out, and I came back in, and I said to these people in this trailer, I said, I've just been through the Milky Way. <laughs> I said, uh huh? Because I looked up at the stars, and they came right down to me. I thought I'd been touched by God. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I was in hell. And what happened to my, my wife, my wife left me, she went back in Christmas 1975, back to England to let me die and get on with my life or whatever I was choosing to do. She didn't know what was up, she didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, she'd had enough, she was tired and exhausted and uh, she never nagged me. She was born for Al-Anon, but she never nagged me. She never said anything, she never got in my way. She used to cry sometimes quietly on her own. That used to really get me. She went back Christmas 75 and I went off to Arizona in the blackout and I uh, stayed in some hotel down there. And I had uh, visions of becoming country western singer, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I sat in this bar listening to Tumsy Hall singing, Oh, dogs, water, melon, wine, or whatever that was. <laughs> oh, and Billy Holiday. Yeah, that was good stuff, Billy Holiday. I played this over and over in this bar, and these people would get fed up with me, and they threw me out of the bar, and I went up to my room in a pretty dirty, lousy hotel, and I wrote on a piece of paper, I met myself in Phoenix, Arizona. I thought that would make a good country western song. And I, I put it on top of the wardrobe. It's probably still there. I ought to go back and see if it's still there. Because in fact, that was the, the irony of that was that I did meet myself in Phoenix, Arizona. I came to terms with something. And I got back on, uh, December 27th. I drove back. My poor car was wrecked because I, you know, sort of speeded back and I was falling asleep at the wheel and all that was going on. I got back to my apartment in West, you know, uh, Wilshire Boulevard. And it was, uh, the loneliest Saturday night that I'd ever spent. December 27th. And I went down to the Beverly Glen Market and I bought uh, my bottle of tequila and orange juice and I was, whatever I was going to do, I was going to just drink myself into the ground or dead. I didn't want to go on. I was so tired and I was so fed up with myself and sick and sick to death with myself. And I, as I was standing in the lineup waiting to pay the cash, at the cash register, this woman was standing in front of me and she said to the man behind the desk, she said, you know, it's a disease now, alcoholism. And I thought, She'd been planted there. I didn't know who she was. <laughs> she looked at my brown paper bag, you know, the uh, drunk all the scandals in the brown paper bag. She has a disease. They say it's progressive as well. I didn't know who she was. But anyway, I got back to my apartment. It was the beginning of the end of everything. And I felt 
that loneliness that only an alcoholic, I don't know, maybe other people didn't, but that loneliness that I certainly felt was the loneliness of the alcoholic, that deep, gnawing, burning loneliness. And I looked across the, the square, the outside of the apartment, and the shadows were getting longer, it's 5.30 in the afternoon, and I wanted to die, and I felt like dying, and I felt the saddest I've ever felt. I felt like all those country western songs. The phone rang, and somebody invited me to a party at uh, Beverly Hills. I went to this kind of nice house, I remember. I don't remember much about it. And I was under the piano most of the time, <laughs> arguing with someone. <laughs> who later came to this program. <laughs> and uh, somebody said, I think it's time he went home. And my agent was there. And I stood on the doorstep of this house. And I said, somebody's stolen my car. He said, no, they haven't stolen it. He said, you, you drove up here and then you drove off. He said, we came and got you. Don't you remember us now? Well, you left your car outside your apartment in the middle of the street. The radio on, the lights on. You don't remember? I said, no. I said, I know one thing. I'm an alcoholic and I need help. Desperately, I said, I'm finished. And what had happened at that moment, as I stared up the eucalyptus trees outside this house, it all flashed before me. Mary, New York, flashed before me. And the real thing that, like Nancy said in, in the first speaker, the car, the thing that really got to me, the thing that woke me up, that I could have killed somebody. I didn't care in the end whether I was going to die or not. I couldn't care less. I could have killed somebody. That was that deep shame that I could have actually killed somebody. I mean, the total, total madness of really driving blindfolded, you know, in the blackout. And I said to this fellow, I said, I'm an alcoholic and I need help. And he took me back to his house because something had happened, some little pilot light went on in my head. And I, I started to sober up from a lot of booze that night, from a lot of alcohol that night. I started to feel sober. My head started to clear very rapidly. I went back to his house up in Benedict Canyon. I mean, I sat there at his house. He looked up the number in the book of AA. and I talked and I said, it's over, I'm finished. And I said, I don't care anymore what happens to me. I said, I just want to get the heat off. I said, I really want to get this monkey off my back. And I was using those terms that I later heard in AA. I may have heard them somewhere else, but I talked about the monkey on my back. And he looked at me and said, I don't know what you mean. I said, I've got it. I can't stop drinking. I've got to stop. So on the Sunday... I sat in my apartment thinking about AA and thinking about getting sober, which is very dangerous for an alcoholic to think too much. So I'm very fortunate to be alive and here tonight. However, I didn't drink that day, and I next Monday morning I phoned up the Westwood Los Angeles office, the, uh, which is on Westwood Boulevard, the Western office, and uh, an elderly lady answered the phone. Her name is Dorothy, and I said, uh, "I'm my name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic, I, and I need help." She said, "Good." I said, uh, she said, do you want somebody to come around and see you? I said, no, no, I didn't want anyone in a dirty raincoat coming around to see me. Either. <laughs> a bottle and the Bible. So I, I drove my car into Westwood and I parked it down to buy some, down over those old railway tracks, uh, railroad tracks that used to be there. And as I was walking across, I thought, well, maybe I'm making too much of a big deal of this alcohol. You know, I'm an actor. I'm dramatizing my life too much. You know, <laughs> calm down. And this other voice that went on simultaneously in my head said, just get your ass to that meeting and do something for yourself for once in your life. Just move now. It was a big, deep voice, like something out of a radio show. And I walked up the street and I found the office and I walked up the stairs. I, I believe the office is moving now, but I walked up the stairs and I walked into this room and there was this elderly lady called Dorothy. And she was everything I needed to meet at that moment. And the office wasn't what I expected. I expected to see people lying on the floor. <laughs> with six days of growth on their chins. And like a weary willy, you know. I expected, nay, yeah, I thought people would all hold hands together and you say, you can go out and drink on Thursday and then we'll come out with you and you can, we can drink on Thursday. And you, you know, that's how I thought it worked. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea that it was the beginning of a whole change of my life. And so I sat in this room and Dorothy talked to me and she said, uh, I said, I'm, I'm finished, I'm beaten, and I feel terrible. She said, that's good. I said, I feel awful. She said, that's wonderful. <laughs> I said, I can't go on. She said, that's wonderful. <laughs> when I looked into her face, I thought, she's either crazy or she's probably a Salvation Army woman that's going to bring out the tambourines. So I didn't know what it was, but I didn't care. And I said, what do I do? She said, well, you go to a meeting tonight. And she told me that she was there because her husband had nearly died, and uh, he was in the motion pictures business, and... Uh, and they had saved his life. And she wasn't actually a member of AA herself. She was just there looking after the phones because she wanted to pay tribute to AA and uh, because of her husband. She wasn't allowed to stay on in the office, unfortunately, as the oh, years went by. But she was so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous for what it had done for her family and for her life and for her husband. 
And I stood up to go, and she said, somebody will come and get you tonight, give me your phone number. And as I stood up, I knew she was going to zap me with the, the bad word, God. But I knew it, and I wanted it to do something, because I wanted something. I wanted some help. I wanted some power to come into my life. I knew that much. I didn't know anything up here, but I knew something had to come into me to help me, or something had to come out of me to help me. And she said, uh, why didn't you just come home and rest and trust in God? And I, something welled up in me and I knew it was over. The jig was up and I just grabbed her and I hugged her and I didn't like touching people at all. I didn't like anyone coming near me. And I felt very emotional and I got out on the street and I, but as I was walking back from my car, the most remarkable thing happened. And it lasted a couple of seconds, I can't remember, but I remember the details of it. A big voice said, it's all over, now you can start living. And don't forget one moment of it, because it's all been for a purpose. Now get on with your life. And I think that that, I know that what that was. I have no theories about it, but it was the presence of a power, God. I don't understand it to this day, but I believe, and I've tried to figure it out, that, that it was the best part of myself, the very foundation of my being. That came out of me, I was part of the essence of life that is in all of us. I'm no theologian, so I can't explain that. But what happened at that moment is that the craving for alcohol left me at that moment, about 11 o'clock in the morning, December 29th, 1975. It's never come back. So a miracle was at work in my life from that moment on. So much so that I called into a Catholic church in Ohio Street. And I saw a priest walking from the church back to his office. I said, can I talk to you, Mom? He said, yeah, sure, come. I said, I've just found God. He said, congratulations. <laughs> and he said, well, something's happened. He said, I don't know what it is. What happened? I said, I'm an alcoholic. I've just joined the air. I think. He said, well, that's great. He said, I said, is it religious? He said, well, uh, if you found God, you shouldn't have any problem with that, whether they're religious or not. I said, well, something's happened. He said, well, that's good. He said, you've been had by God. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's been, you've been had by God. He said, you've been surrendered somehow. He said, like being seduced. It's like being had in sexual terms. I said, really? I looked at him. He had that little kind of collar on. I said, really? He said, yep. He said, that's what it was. He said, but, you know, he said, AA is a great organization. He said, I know a little about it, but you just do what they tell you. And I got back to my apartment, and um, uh, later that afternoon, I poured the, what beer or whatever it was I had in the fridge. I poured it away. That afternoon, the phone rang, and uh, later that morning, the phone rang, and somebody called Don the phone. He said, uh, my name is Don. I'm an alcoholic. Is that Tony? I said, yeah. So I hear you, uh, you need help. I said, yeah. He said, have you had a drink? I said, no. He said, because we're devious sons of bitches, all of us. And he put the phone down. He said, I can't take you to meet somebody else. Will. And about an hour later, somebody else phone called George. George C., I'll never forget it. He said, my name is George, I'm an alcoholic, and your name is Tony. I said, yeah. He said, I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. He said, good, I'm going to pick you up. What's your address? I told him. He said, good, I'll pick you up at 6.30. He put the phone down. I said, damn, I can't stop him coming now because I've got to go. <laughs> the cunning mind is still working this evening. I still wanted a way out, but I knew it was over. I knew I had to go through this. And 6.30 that night, uh, the bell rang downstairs, and I went down, and there was George. He was everything I expected. There was a light blue jacket on. He smelled of aftershave lotion, and he looked like a Southern Baptist. And he had his steel gray hair and crooked teeth, and he had his girlfriend with him. She chewed gum. <laughs> she said, hi, honey. I sat in the back of their car and forgot I'm in, I'm in with the loonies now, the moonies. <laughs> well, he drove up over sunset and he, I could see the back of his grey head and he talked about the ego and he never shut up for the whole journey. <laughs> he talked about bottoming out, I didn't know what he was talking about. But I knew something that I, and I could smell this aftershave lotion I thought I'm really in with the crazy people now, but I don't care. I do anything they ask me to do, I don't care anymore. We put in the par car park of the Pacific Palisades group, that uh, big meeting out there. That's my home group. Although I live in London now. And uh, as I got out of the car, there was a, an elderly fellow walking ahead. And he was an actor I'd worked with. He was quite an old man. And uh, he was walking ahead down into the main meeting. And I said to George, I said, what, what's he doing here? He's, he's an alcoholic. I said, is he really? I said, I just worked with him. He said, well, he's an alcoholic like you. So I went down and Bob was in the room. And somebody came up to me. A woman was introduced to me. And uh, her name was Laverne. And George said, this is Tony. He's got 24 hours. He said, that's fantastic. And she jumped all over me. <laughs> I thought, well, this is, this is promising. <laughs> Bob came over and said, hi, Tony. He said, we worked together last year for one day on a publicity thing. I said, yeah. He said, come on, I've got a... I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm an alcoholic. I said, oh. I said, I think I am. So he said, good. 
And I went and sat down, and this old actor came and said, Hello, Tony, so how are you? He said, I've got a chair waiting for you. I'm glad you made it. He knew. I said, did you know? He said, just give me that smile. He said, yeah, I knew you were an alcoholic. All right. And I sat there, and uh, the first speaker was this doctor, Don, from uh, Palos Verdes, and he looked like everything I dreamed of from the last weekend. <laughs> he had lank black hair, and his face looked like he'd been walked into a truck. <laughs> his mind was Don, and I'm an alcoholic. I thought, there's a real alcoholic there. <laughs> and I'd always loved the word alcoholic. I was in a play once, a television play, some years ago, before I stopped drinking, my last year before I stopped drinking, and I actually said this thing, and I said, I'm an alcoholic in this play. And I said to the director of this play, I said, that's a great word, alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I was saying it in this play. I think that 12 step me about 18 months later, wasn't it? Because I looked at this guy, I thought, there he is, this is the man I am. He talked about, uh, he talked about his car being alcoholic. He only had one headlamp and, uh, you know. <laughs> and only one windshield wiper. And he talked about drinking v- vodka or whiskey out of his ski poles. <laughs> I thought these people were crazy. And then, uh, we had a coffee break and, uh, the next guy got up was a man called Chuck C. And he was amazing. And he said, my name's Chuck, I'm an alcoholic. And he said, by the grace of God, I'll have 30 years sober this channel. I thought he must be suffering from brain damage. How could anyone have 30 years? But what happened that night was that I sat between Bob and George and a whole education came to me in a flash. They talk about near-death experiences. Well, I think maybe this is what I was going through in another form because I don't know how because I'm no, I'm no intellectual giant. I'm no intellect at all. I'm not too smart. But something happened to me. Something rushed through my head. Something rushed into my consciousness which told me everything I needed to know for those moments, and really saved my life. Because I realized that everything I'd been looking for had come to me that moment, that I'd finally come home. And I don't know how I grasped that. I'm only glad I did. That I'd come home. And that I didn't even get my act together. Because I'd been trying to get my act together all my life. And Chuck C. said that night, he said, you know, he was brought up to outsmart everyone and outwit everyone, and he ended up in the squirrel cave. My father said that to me, God rest his soul. My father was an alcoholic, I believe. And he said, you know, outsmart them before they can outsmart them. You, get them before they can get you. Don't trust anyone. And my father said all those things, but he never acted like it. He was a big softy like all our gods are. But he tried to be tough, you know, and he tried to make me tough. And I wasn't. I was a big softy. I was just mush inside. And after the meeting, I remember, I, I, I looked for my checkbook. I thought, I've got to pay these people. Because I now knew that I was absent. That absent from me was the craving to drink. Something had happened in that one night. Now, being a quick study in many ways, I thought, I'd better not trust this too much. I was taken over after I met Chucksy. And he said, uh, I just introduced him, and he, said, uh, he was told that I had 24 hours on a sober day. He put his arms on my shoulders. He said, you just keep coming back. He said, because we get better than better. He said, we are suffering from a seemingly hopeless disease. We get better than better. He said, God love you and all that. He gave me a hug and I went on my way. Next night, I was in 2 plus 2 in uh, West Los Angeles, in West Boulevard. And I saw God as love on the church window, the melon window, and that really put me off. And what really crucified me was the word hope. I got very depressed and I wanted to leave, and Bob, who was sitting here tonight, said, he came back with me, he said, you don't have to leave. And he came back and sat with me and listened to me. Uh, he doesn't mind my telling him, telling me the story, but anyway, he helped me a great deal that night. He made me laugh. And I think within my, uh, at the end of my second week, I was at Darrow Day and I heard Clancy speak. So in two weeks of sobriety, I heard Clancy and I heard Chuck C. And they had such impact on me that I realized that this was the best thing that could have ever happened to the person I met. And free. Didn't have to pay for it. Most amazing education I've ever had. And the years have gone by, and the days have gone by, and they've turned into months and years. I don't know how this works. I know that it works extremely well. But it is like the kingdom, I guess, that we've been looking for in peace and spirit. I don't understand it, because what I've put into this program and into this life is nothing compared to what I've got back. I've been given an abundance. And these last few years, it's like something has slipped away from me. Like, um, I keep thinking of those rocket ships that go off, you know, and they jettison parts of themselves as they escape the Earth's orbit. It's like parts of some kind of ballast keep slipping away. And I feel lighter. And I don't understand it. I don't have to strain for it. I go to meetings and I hope I'm helpful. 
I hope I carry the message in my imperfect way. I'm in a profession where there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs are taken. But I'm having the best time of my life. I'm having the very best time of my life. And I can't, I cannot take credit for it. I feel I cannot take credit for it. Somebody said the other day, you should. I said, well, maybe. But I got here because I had nothing, nowhere else to go. What's that green light for? Is that it? No. I had, I had nowhere else to go. And I, I came to America in 1974 looking for fame, fortune, and a big pot of gold. And I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Much to my surprise, it's the last place I ever intended to come to. So it's been an amazing journey. And the weird and peculiar thing I get about my life now, in a strange way, I can't really describe it, is that in a strange way it's none of my business. I get out of bed in the morning and I I'm not a deeply religious person. I don't know what I am. Sometimes I have a lot of doubts. Sometimes I think, well, maybe there's nothing there at all. But then I check out and I think, well, how have I stayed sober for 18 years? Through groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, the Pacific Group, the people like Clancy, the Chucksy, the Bob, through all of you. But how? So I don't analyze anymore. I try not to anyway. I just accept. Because I said to someone when I got sober, I said, why did it happen? They said, why not? So for my uh, not very smart brain, that's a good enough answer. Why not? Screen light is staring in the face. I don't really have much more to say, except that I'm immensely grateful. I don't want to go on talking because if I've run out of... I am so grateful. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's the best thing that's ever happened to alcoholics. And I go back over the years, and hey, hey, my spiritual home seems to be in Los Angeles. I live in England. That's okay. I come back here, and I, my car drives itself now. I seem to. I know it so well here. This is my spiritual home. Really. And I see old friends here that I haven't seen for some years. So fancy at the beginning. And it's like a whole history. What I find is incredible is the longevity, is the actual continuity. Continuity. So my old friend Tommy here today. It's the continuity. So many of us could have died. And so many are dying at the moment not knowing what's killing them. And I'm glad that night when I was able to identify myself as an alcoholic when I read those 20 questions and I got 19 of them right. <laughs> and I cheered. I thought, yes! I've identified the X factor. I've identified the brand mark. Drunk. And it's like a medal. And my, my drinking years are all part of my sobriety. I wouldn't have missed it. I don't want to go back there. But I wouldn't have missed that world because I've been given to life. Not much more to say. Except I thank you very much. I thank Marilyn. I thank Clancy. I thank you all for a wonderful life. God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.